You got to take care of everybody. You got to fight their battles. Like you got to provide, you got to look out for danger, all this kind of stuff. And you kind of live with this pressure of performing all the time, right? And I want to speak to some older brothers tonight, some older sisters tonight, that if we're not careful, there's, a, there's like a, a scale that on one side, it's the older brother. It's performance-based Christianity. It's what you do for the Lord that you think that earns his favor. And on the other side of the scale, it's the prodigal problem, where you take God's grace, you take his inheritance, and you extravagantly waste it. You live your own life. Tipping the scales either way is not a good thing. God wants you to, it says in James, faith without works is dead. So there should be faith uh, works coming out of your faith, but your faith shouldn't just remain dormant and nothing happen in your life. That's why God, God talks about fruit so often, that your life should show fruit. That's how you know that you're remaining in Christ. But we're going to talk about the older brother syndrome, and some of you might face this um, right now. Maybe some of you are even doing this. I think one thing that we can recognize in the older brother is that there's this sense of self-righteousness that he kind of puts on himself. And self-righteousness, feeling superior than his younger brother. And maybe you, you felt like that before, where you feel superior to maybe your family members or friends, and um, that maybe they don't share the same values or work ethic. And I know you're not like this, but I've said this from time to time. I'm, you know, I'm struggling in this area, but at least I'm not bad, as bad as so-and-so. <laughs> at least I'm not as you know, horrible as this person. And you start comparing yourself to other people's lives in your life, and you put yourself a notch above everybody else. You're feeling superior to the people that are struggling. Or maybe judging. Some of you might be dealing with some of that. And I know this is kind of harsh. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of punching you guys in the face with the scripture tonight, but I think it's good because we need a little bit of a heart check from time to time because we got to represent Christ out there. We can't think that we have everything together. we got to do that and, and be humble regularly. So maybe you're dealing with judging. Maybe it's family members or friends with their lifestyle choices or um, their struggles, and you judge them without offering any support or compassion. Like, they should know better, or they deserve that. You know, like someone that hits rock bottom, and you're like, I told them. I told them not to do that, that it was going to hurt, but they got hurt anyway. Now they got to deal with the consequences, right? And you just let them suffer. That's not good. Or believing that your own spiritual disciplines or standards make you more favored by God. Like, can you, I haven't missed a Bible reading day since you version came out. Like, I am like living the streak right now. Or maybe it's like, you know, I'm, I'm the prayer warrior. Like, I pray like two hours a day and you tell everybody like, oh my gosh, like I'm so close to God right now. Like, you, what do you want? You want a parking stall? I got it. You want this? I got you. Me and God, we're like this because I do so much for him. Or how about this? Resentment. Have you ever felt jealous or, or, or kind of uh, harboring bitterness to someone like a sibling or a coworker? Maybe they got the raise that you wanted. Maybe they got, you know, support from your parents for something. And you're like, how come they got it? Or you minimize their achievements because you're kind of insecure and you're kind of like, uh, I wanted to succeed. Like, like why, are you, why are we celebrating you right now? I'm the important one. And you're resentful for them for winning in life or, or what they've accomplished. Or how about this? Being angry when a family member or friend receives forgiveness or grace from others after making mistakes. I've had some family members in, in recent times and they've made mistakes and we've forgiven them, and it's, it's hard. And sometimes that can split families, right? Like, I forgive that person, this other person doesn't forgive the person, and everybody wants to be on one side, and it's a difficult thing to deal with. But having resentment build up in your heart is a slippery slope. And this is something that the Pharisees dealt with big time, is exclusivity. Avoiding, not befriending people, coworkers, neighbors, or classmates who come from different backgrounds. And you form like these exclusive circles. You know, I, I was in the, the youth ministry here at Anchor, 
um, for, for a long time, a uh, worship leader. And I remember being a youth leader, there was this one um, staff member that was helping out with the youth that kind of formed these clicky exclusive circles. Like he would get all the, the surfers, the good looking people, and it was kind of like a collection. It was, it was, uh, it was, I didn't realize it at the time, but I started to look at all the people in the group and we tried to invite other people in and they're like, oh no, they're not, they just don't have it. I, I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, they, they're, oh, they're hanging out with that group already. You know, we don't, we don't need them. We got, we have enough in our group. And then when we tried to make friends and we left the group to go hang out with other people, it was like this possessive thing and they, we got cut off from that group because, you know, we associated with other people because it was too exclusive. Have you ever felt like that before? You're like, man, I want to break out of this group, but it just feels unhealthy. It feels kind of like, feels kind of toxic, right? Exclusivity. God's all about inclusivity in his kingdom. And he's trying to tell the Pharisees this. How about this one? Legalism. Prioritizing Adhering to specific religious rules or practices over demonstrating the love and the grace of God in relationships. There's always a balance to that. And I think some people and a lot of Christians fall into this legalistic category where we judge people and we're like, no, I don't have any time for grace or compassion. You should know better. Judging people for not observing the the fast that we do. We do like a fast every year, the 21 days of prayer and fasting. I think we did 12 or 14 days this year or practicing the Sabbath, or spiritual, other spiritual disciplines. And like, you might be like, I don't, I don't really deal with legalism. I'm pretty good, right? I want to tell you a story. Maybe this will paint a bigger, better picture for you. Okay, so this guy, John, he's a longtime Christian, and he takes great pride in his consistent church attendance. He's a gold star attender. He tithes. He's on the dream team in multiple areas. And he believes that his adherence to these practices, like he's, he's doing all the right things, and it sets him apart as a true believer, and it earns him favor with God. One day, John's coworker Sam, shares his testimony of coming to faith in Christ. They're like around the water cooler, and like, oh, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian too, I just came to the Lord. And he says this, after years of struggling with addiction and pr- promiscuity, kind of like going and sleeping around. He hits rock bottom, and he comes to the Lord, and he's telling John this story. And when John's initially happy for Sam's conversion, he becomes quickly critical of his failure to immediately adopt the same religious practices that he does and the standards that he upholds. And John begins to question the authenticity of Sam's faith, believing that his past struggles and worldly appearance indicates a lack of genuine repentance. He avoids spending time with him outside of work. He declines to invite him to his small group, fearing that his presence might compromise the group's spiritual purity. So this story kind of illustrates John's legalistic attitude, and it causes him to prioritize external behaviors, external things, rather than the transformative power of God's grace in Sam's life. The church is made up of broken people, guys. There's no way around that. You're broken, I'm broken, we're all broken, and God's just constantly trying to put us back together. And this thing of performance-based Christianity and legalism is such a dangerous trap. Like, the Pharisees were really good at it, but Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs. Outwardly great, but dead on the inside. And there's such a danger to do that because we like, as humans, we like to accomplish things. We like to put things into systems, and, and if I do this, then I get this. And God always wants our hearts to be tender towards him and to other people. And we need to recognize that salvation is a gift of God's grace, and it's not earned through religious practices or moral standards. It's only because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. That's the gift of salvation that we talk about. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not for your, from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. You can't say that I saved myself, but that it's by God's grace that I'm even here and I'm saved through Jesus Christ. We need to embrace that the truth that all believers are works in progress and that spiritual growth is a lifelong journey. It's not linear, right? 
it kind of goes all over the place. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We also need to extend grace and compassion to other people and acceptance to others regardless of their past struggles or mistakes. Colossians 3, 12 to 14 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, as Christians, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So that's so key. And we got to prioritize heart transformation, an authentic faith over outward displays of righteousness. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Pharisees had, like, their value system was totally off of what God's was. And here's the last thing of the older brother syndrome. Maybe you deal with a difficulty celebrating others. Maybe you have a hard time celebrating others' accomplishments or recognizing when they've overcome, like, an addiction or something like that. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says, love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run from dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to, to good. And be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing the second fiddle. I love that part where you don't have to be first chair, but you can practice playing the supporting role to someone, that you can help lift someone up to be a better version of themselves, that you can actually exalt someone and say, look at what God did in their life. Can you believe how good God is? Do you see what God blessed them with? Isn't that amazing? The word says to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Sometimes it's deserving of being rejoiced in, but we kind of, we, we kind of minimize the blessing that God has done in their life because we're jealous or we're harboring resentment or bitterness towards them. So, older brother syndrome. Maybe you have prodigal problems. And I'm just going to go through these kind of quick. Maybe you face rebellion. you kind of like turning your, your, your back on your parents or spiritual mentors. Or maybe you face yourself kind of getting into self-indulgent. You're doing these selfish things to satisfy yourself. Like, I'm going to take care of my needs, and I'm going to put everybody else on the back burner. And that's, it's okay to take care of yourself, but I think at the expense of everybody else, that's when it becomes an issue, right? And when you withdraw from people, it like leads to disconnection. You like rebel, self-indulgent, doing all these things, and then you disconnect from people, and you withdraw from Christian community, accountability, relationships, and then you start feeling shame and unworthiness and disillusionment. I call this the shame shack. And the enemy wants you to walk into the shame shack, close the door, and lock it. But it's an inside lock. It's not the one that's not locked on the outside. Because the enemy can't make you do anything. He has no power over you if you believe in Jesus. But he'd like to trick you into walking into the shame shack and locking the door and being there by yourself.